In this frame example, we're going to apply the moment distribution method to figure out what the member and moments for each member will be. We're going to, before we charge off of that, we're going to get an approximate answer to all this. We got a 14 foot high uh, story height, 24 foot uh, bay width, so of course the drawing is not really quite to scale. The two columns are identical to each other at 600 inches to the fourth. The beam is at 800 inches to the fourth, and we're supporting three kips per foot. Fixed ends at either uh, lower support. Note that the structure, the foundations, and the uh, loading is symmetric, so we will not have any sway even though theoretically we could have sway. Hence we can take advantage of that and not include any sway in the system because of this total perfect symmetry. In our approximate approach and model, remember what we do oftentimes is say, well, that top beam is somewhere in between pin pin at the far ends and fix fixed pin pin the inflection point would be at the uh, absolute ends in the fixed fixed case with this distributed load it would be at 0.21L and our approximation then might be to do something that's in the middle of those two that is and that would be to say let's take the points of inflection at that one tenth location In this case, that would be 2.4 feet on either end, leaving us 19.2 feet, I believe, in the middle. 2.4 times 2 would be 4.8. 4.8 plus that would be 24. So good, we got that. All right, so now let's go look <coughs> briefly at that middle portion that is only 19.2 feet long. It has then the distributed load on it. 3 kips per foot. And we'll have N shears, knows no end moments because that's at the inflection point location. It's of course going to be half of that total load that is there. 3 times 19.2 divided by 2 will give us 28.8. And the maximum moment in that segment, of course, would be WL squared over 8. <coughs> So 3 times 19.2 squared divided by 8, or a maximum moment of about 138.2, happening right here, then in the middle. And we've got then those inflection points at the 2.4 foot mark. And because of the nature of this nice second order curve that's going to be nice and continuous even beyond the inflection point, hey, why is that? Because that's a nice continuous beam, right? There's no actual real release here. We're just guessing where that inflection point is, and we're going to have the same general trend that's going on because the loading, of course, is the same all the way through. All right, so that's at 2.4 feet, and this would be... Um, also at 2.4 feet from the right. And so now let's go get what this, these end moments are. There's different ways we could go about doing that. One way certainly is just to draw the free by diagram that goes along with that portion of the beam. There's still your three. We got the shear coming down at 28.8. We'll have an end shear, which had better be half of the total load on that beam. 3 times 2.4 plus the 28.8 equals 36. Right? What you don't know is that I did this problem earlier and made a mistake, and I figured it out because my reaction wasn't correct here, and it was all because I couldn't do the simple subtraction of 24 minus 2 times 2.4 correctly, and it showed up right here. Of course, that's not in equilibrium. We need this member end moment, <coughs> and that will be 28.8 times 2.4 plus 3 times 2.4 times this moment arm of 1.2 or 77.8 there and that would be in the end of the beam at minus 77.8 that's our approximation here for what's going on in the 
uh, the, the beam. Now, as far as the column goes, there's an axial force that's actually present here, and that will ultimately have an impact on things. So I got to be a little bit careful how we're going to approach this. Uh, what I'm going to do is draw a free by diagram of the column, put the whole column and this little fraction of the beam. And you know, every time I do this, I have to have a moment where I say, "Wait a minute, how do I do this again?" We know the shear. That's 28.8. We don't know the axial force, and down at the base, we have then lateral force, and we have a bending moment. All right now, we know that from previous work that that's going to be a reaction here at the at D that's acting to the left. Axial force will be acting to the right. We're going to have the moment down here at the base of the column that we're trying to figure out. And then we, of course, have the axial force. That's the easy one. That's just going to be the 36. Right? So unfortunately, though, we have one, two, three pieces of information and that we need to find. That's, oh, man, you know, how the heck do we do this? That's 14 feet. That's 2.4 feet. Because if we sum moments here, then all we're going to get is a relationship between this dx, which becomes this axial force up here. All right? We know those are equal and opposite values. You know, this gets to look to be a little bit tricky about how we might all do this. All right? So there's some maybe some other free body diagrams we could take a look at. We could though recognize something really important. And that is that we don't have sway in this system. And if we don't have sway in the system, then that column is in reality. By the way, there's another way to, to get to what I'm about to do. But in effect, that column without any sway is going to look like a propped cantilever. And we know that that means that when we turn the corner, on these, this joint, and we look at what's going on here. Hey, on that side we've got a clockwise moment. The effect of the column on the beam is a clockwise moment. That means the effect of the beam on the column is a counterclockwise moment at 77.8. And we know that that in this situation that we're going to have a carryover moment at the far end that's going to be half of that. And that's 38.9. It means its inflection point in this particular situation would be one-third of the way up, right? Because a moment diagram for that, to have that two-to-one ratio would look something like this. And this would be at 14 over 3 feet off the ground. All right, so that's a little bit of a, I don't know, a clever way of getting out of the box that you're thinking, how do we do that? But in our model, we can pretty easily predict what's happening because there was no sway associated with that symmetry that we had. And so now we end up with that 77.8, that's 36 down at the bottom, 36. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not either 36, that's 38.9. And notice I also am being a little, I don't know about sloppy, but I'm not writing down whether it's positive or negative moment. Um, I'm drawing it on the compression side. I'm going to have curvature that looks like that and that and that. Um, whether you call it positive or negative just is an arbitrary decision of where you're putting the origin of your local coordinate system. And so I'm not going to get too fussy about that right now. When we get into computer models, we'd have to be perhaps a lot more careful about how we're setting that up. That's the end of the approximate analysis. The next stage we're going to go and do an exact, well, exact as in doing a numerical approach with the moment distribution method.